between the rise of the Kimrog Empire and the tumultuous Demon Wars, there was an enigmatic era. A time when brave souls traversed oceans and continents in search of glory, riches, and power. Let us tell you of the days of high adventure. Hello and welcome to High Adventures. This prequel focuses on Cade, the middle son of the three sons. And, um, Kale, go ahead and explain the concept of Cade. What was his life like as uh, <clears throat> one of the sons, as, as the, the middle son? What was his relationship with the family like? Give us a little background on that. Uh, so Cade's, Cade's background kind of goes, he's very close with his family, but at the same time, he's always had a curiosity inside of him where he loved to go exploring. He had a big love for animals and wanting to understand them and their environment. So he was, while he did spend time with his brothers, getting in trouble with them, of course, on occasion, he would still go out by himself when he was able or just sneak around to go, uh, exploring. And um, the relationship with your parents is somewhat complicated because Kate had kind of one sort of relationship with his father, but a very different relationship with his mother. Talk a little bit about that. Well, with the father, he was more of a give you orders kind of guy. He's going he's gonna to tell you what to do. And Cade, Cade has more of a free spirit, so that kind of didn't gel well with him. While he did try to uh, appease his father, sometimes he just did because it just wasn't in his nature. And on the opposite side with his mother, she was a little more forgiving of Cade's interests because that's just the way she loved her son. She wanted him to do what he liked. And when Cade was of age, he left the family to kind of go out and make his way in the world. What was that like when when he left the capital city of the province, which is a, is a very dynamic, uh, vibrant, <clears throat> busy environment with a lot of different kind of social levels between families and nobility and, and where, you know, the laws and honor are kind of really important. What, that was a kind of a stark contrast when Cade left what was it like? I think at first it was a little bit of a shock. Cause he, I mean, he said, like I said, he did some exploring, but, but when he left, it was very different. And he just wasn't sure how to handle it at first, but quickly he came around to just loving the idea of how it was out in nature. And um, while he left with some things that he Probably, probably the average person wouldn't because of his background he came from. Uh, he shed most of those things that he did, didn't need and uh, just embraced and uh, embraced exploring and being by himself. And after a year of like living off the land and being kind of isolated and separated from society, something very mystical happened and Cade began to understand a, a deeper more magical connection to the natural world <clears throat> what was it like when he made his connection with the moon it was it was a very I would I would say it was a gradual change on certain certain nights when the moon was at its like its zenith. He would feel like a tug and uh, towards the moon, and he would look and just he would feel that start starting to feel that connection. And then um, one day or one night, actually, uh, he really felt the call, 
and he went into like a meditative trance and formed a connection and that's when he uh, first received those powers that he has now. And what was the first animal spirit that revealed itself uh, <clears throat> to Cade, allowing him to understand how he could himself transform? There would be, when he got that connection the very first time, uh, a short while later, uh, on another night when the moon, uh, the moon was at its uh, most powerful, he was meditating and he woke up and then not very far from him, near his campfire was a giant wolf. And at first being very surprised and on the defensive, he realized that he wasn't going to be attacked. And we started to come to the understanding that he could turn into this wolf too. And that's what he did. Hmm. And over the next few years, as he grew deeper and deeper with his connection um, to the natural world and developed his knowledge and understanding of his circle, he came to understand that there were others like him who referred to themselves as shape changers and explained to Cade that they were very special and very rare. And that some people, particularly the larger, you know, more civilized clans that, that had cities and kind of more urban dwelling, um, were very suspicious and even aggressive towards your kind. Um, and yet out in the more rural communities, there were many folk who were kind of more appreciative and thought that uh, shape changers were somehow special um, and, you know, that they were, they possessed the spirits of, of animals and, and certain wisdom and ability was bestowed to them. And they were kind of a little more grateful. Um, and as you kind of came to know just a few of the others um, who were like you, you learned to speak with them, you, you learned from them and with them. But then each of you would kind of seasonally go your separate ways and live in isolation um, for a long time. And then, mm -hmm. you know, kind of every spring, you'd have these gatherings. Um, and this continued for a few years. Um, and you have since become very confident in your abilities. And you feel like your understanding and your closeness has grown. Um, you are no longer the city boy who went on an adventure into the wilderness. You are now more comfortable in yourself than you've ever been, knowing what you know and feeling like you almost have a role as sort of a protector. And the, the area in the province where you have found yourself most comfortable is actually a valley um, there's a lot of water flow there, natural springs, creeks, and it's a very lush valley. There's bamboo forests, there's rolling hills, and a lot of wildlife, and, and it's not really good farmland. Um, and, and actually, there aren't any farms around or villages around for many miles. So you find yourself at peace there, because it's basically just you and nature and the animals that live there. Mm -hmm. And it is at this point where we pick up one fine late summer day when um, you were just kind of on a hike. You're checking out your, you know, your, your area basically. Um, and everything seems to be in order, but far off in the distance, you hear the shouting of men. Um, and kind of across the bamboo plain, you you hear the shouting of men. I'll look in that direction and just cock my head. Just you can't see anything from where you are, but you definitely hear voices and, and like shouting and barking orders and responses. You feel like if you move closer, you might be able to, to see what's going on. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be heading in that direction. This is 
there shouldn't really be anybody out here. Yeah, it's very odd. Um, go ahead and make a stealth check as you're moving through the bamboo. It's it's not so much about visibility; it's more about like whether or not you you make a lot of noise splashing through the wet areas or moving a lot of bamboo back and forth. That was a six. Okay. You're you're not even really so much concerned, but you move quickly. You move quickly through and you find yourself kind of at the edge of the bamboo and you, you look up this short hill that's about 20 feet tall that kind of comes up to a rise and it's mm-hmm. It's not a road by any stretch, but it's basically dry land. Yeah. In this kind of wet area and people use it occasionally. Travelers will be going along this this burn. It's basically just a hill that stretches on for a long ways. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you'll see farmers that are using this with their carts or their wagons to go into a village to sell their crops but very rarely do you get travelers along this route. And as you kind of are peeking through the edge of the bamboo forest, you're looking up and you see a group of four men who um, all of them are wearing padded armor and all of them have swords out. And one of them seems to be a leader and he says, look over on that side. We'll find him. You two go to this side. Maybe he's taking cover. And they are apparently walking down this road looking for someone. Uh, make another perception check. Uh, perception. That's a lot. That's a twenty-five. Okay. So as you see these men, who, you know, they're they're up above you. So you're kind of like looking up at this road. Um, but they're also like 30 feet away. So you're you're kind of at the edge. And as you see them and hear them kind of like aggressively on the hunt for someone, you look over to your left and you notice a man, a middle-aged man who is, is bald on the top and has like a crown of hair. Mm-hmm. And, um, and he's wearing like basically common clothes, okay? but he has clearly been cut. Right, like, he's hurt. You see blood, he, you see him like holding his shoulder and there's blood soaking his shirt. And he seems to be like wounded. Um, mm-hmm. And you see he's bruised on his face as well. And and he sees you and you see him. And and he's he's obviously in pain. And he mm-hmm. looks like he's been running for a while. Um, you see he has no shoes and his feet are all cut up as if he's been running over rocks or rough terrain. Okay. And and he's he like looks at you, make an insight check. Okay. Oh god. That's weird. Uh insight. That was another twenty five, I rolled a natural next. Wow, you have absolutely no doubt that this man, that his life depends on you. Like, he hasn't said anything, but you could tell tell by the look and as he glances up at those men and then he glances back at you without saying a word, you could tell that basically it is up to you whether this man lives or dies. Uh, I won't say anything, but I'll just go and as I do that, he seems I make relieved, a little... and he nods, and he he like he's just holding his wound. And then I'll make a I'll mutter a soft uh, druidic uh, some druidic words, and uh, wave my hand, and I'm going to cast pass without trace, and I'll move close to him within thirty feet. And are you moving away from the hill, like to ambush uh, those guys? No, I'm only moving moving closer to the to the guy that's hiding. Okay. So I need I want you, him in within my range. You you conduct yourself and suddenly it is as if all of nature 
is providing you with a level of magical protection. As you move closer to him, the bamboo barely even moves. It, it, you don't even need to move the bamboo. It almost seems to move for you. And the sound of your feet sloshing through the muck is barely audible. And you get down crouched next to him. And you could see that he's obviously been on the run and probably looks like he may have fallen um, and scraped himself and he's bruised and and his wound is looks relative relatively like fresh as if he was stabbed within the last half an hour um meanwhile you see up above that the 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 armed men that were looking hunting for him two of them have split off and you see like one of them kind of stop on the edge of the berm and he takes a few steps down like he's coming towards you and he Mm -hmm. scans through the bamboo and you see his eyes literally pass over the area where you guys are and he just continues to like look. Um, make your stealth roll. Okay. With your bonus from Pass Without Trace. <clears throat> this will check out. Go ahead. This will be, yeah. So this will be covering you and the wounded man. That's okay. So that's 18 with my regular bonus. So that's 28 <laughs> with the Pass Without Trace. Okay. So the, the one armed man like literally just scans across the bamboo and then goes back and like looks again and then he turns and climbs back up the road um how long does pass without trace last uh concentration up to an hour Ooh, all right so how long do you wait because you can hear them on both sides of the road kind of looking through the forest you hear that one guy barking off orders Find him. He must be close. He could not have gotten away. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to wait too long because what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, cast your wounds on this gentleman. Okay. Which he gets. Uh, yeah, he gets eight, eight, eight points back. Okay. You you see that he immediately seems to be in better shape. Um, His wound is not bleeding. Um, There's probably still some damage, but he seems, he seems relieved. And you notice that he kind of seems shocked at your abilities. And he, he, he like leans forward and he just whispers. He's like, thank you. And he bows. Quiet, you need to get out of here. And I'm gonna lead him out of there. Okay. So you're going to go back towards your valley. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you begin making your way back and leading him using Pass Without Trace through the bamboo forest. And you get back to your your hidden valley. And you finally come to rest on an area along the riverbank where there's some nice rocks and trees for shade. And it's it's comfortable and warm. And you sit with this middle-aged man who now that you're far away he says i i am truly in your debt uh, young man you you have saved me from certain doom thank you once again you're most welcome what is uh, your name uh, my name is hoon lee i i wonder if i could trouble you if you have any food or water i have been on the run for at least two days now. No problem at all. And I'll, I mean, I'm in my own home now. I can just get into some of my uh, food storage and some water. Yeah, you have a line of smoked fish that you caught and, and you know, you so you pull down some, some dried fish and, and um, you have like wild rice. So you basically prepare some food and he, he eats, he drinks water, uh, the, the water from the, the river's clean. And, and after some time, you know, he's, he begins to kind of talk with you. And he says, uh, I am in your debt. You, you have truly 
saved me from, from certain doom. I, I do not know how I can repay you, but I will tell you that the men who were after me were not good men. Tell me who these people are. They serve a very selfish and cruel lord. And their corruption knows no bounds. They, they steal and tax from all of the farmers and villagers in the province. And they bribe officials within the bureaucracy to overlook these, these crimes. People have no one to turn to. Long ago, when I was young, like you, I was a soldier, but I left their service when I saw their wickedness. And I began to, to take back from them what they had stolen and return it to the people. And for a time, the people were empowered and they rose up and defied these corrupt masters. And I thought that my time had come. I retired to my work and I was proud to, to farm and live my life as a free man. But five years ago, new cruel and wicked men came to power and formed a, a coalition and began once again their reign of tyranny against the people. I refused to, to pay their high taxes, and for that they burned my farm, left me with nothing. And so once again, I have resumed my, my duty to rise up against these tyrants. Does he give a name of who the new, new uh, like overlord or who's taking over there? There are many of them, but the Lord who rules over those men is Joe and Lai. Would Cade know about these people from his background? Uh, where uh, you, you could make a history check. Uh, we'd love to do that. Which you're not bad at. Yeah, yeah it was also a bad roll. Um, that's just a 10. Yeah, you don't, you don't know. And part of the reason why you don't know is actually because you haven't been in the capital of the province. So, like, you're not privy to changes within the bureaucracy that have happened in the last few years so you're not really mm -hmm. familiar but um something does strike you as he mentions his name of kun lee you remember when you were a child that there was kind of this like folk hero um that was you know popular amongst the commoners in the province mm -hmm. uh this this legendary soldier and swordsman who fought against corrupt officials and took money from them and returned it to the poor. Okay. And you, you remember this, like these stories of this brave folk hero from mm -hmm. when you were a kid. And as you look at this man, it's hard to imagine because he does not look like a soldier. He's still... He still has physical strength, but it's more of like the build of like a farmer. Right. Hard uh, work, hard yeah. work muscle. And, and very, you know, calloused uh, hands and, and, you know, but, but, but he's older and you, you kind of look at him and he's not wielding any weapons. I mean, he literally has just the clothes on his body. Yeah. He doesn't even have shoes. So it's, it's, it's a stark contrast as you realize <clears throat> This 
you know, childhood um, folk hero is this older man standing, you know, seated before you. Well, these people need to leave my bow, my area. This is under my protection. I Please. have no reason to believe they would come here, but I am concerned about something else. What would that There be? is a hamlet of farmers, a cooperative of six families who farm land not more than four miles from here. I know the area. Those soldiers are heading in that direction looking for me. And if they believe that any of those farm families are hiding me, they will be brutal in their search and in their interrogations. And they will be most dissatisfied in not finding me. And I fear they will punish those who stand in their way. I do not have my weapon, but I would fight for those farmers. If you would join me, perhaps we could stand up against them, against the soldiers. I'll do this. And I'm going to take out my uh, scimitar. I'm going to hand it to him. He, he looks at it like surprised. I, I don't need this. He's like, I am honored. And you see, he kind of stands up and he's, he grips the scimitar. And you see, he begins to kind of like swing it back and forth. Almost kind of like judging its weight and its balance. And then his wrists kind of begin to move. First time he does the, the move, you hear his wrists actually crack. Like, and his knuckles kind of pop, but then he, he sort of stretches out with the sword and begins kind of swirling it through the air in this in this motion that begins kind of like jerky, but then gradually, as a few minutes go by, you see as he's practicing this form, it it's like his body memory his muscle memory begins to return and and his fluidity of his motion becomes evident and you you see before you this process of this man almost like like remembering his sword and and by the end of like the five minutes of warm-ups and practicing his form He's, I mean, the sword is flashing at incredible speeds and he's moving around in this dirt patch next to the river and, and you're just watching in awe. And, and he finishes his form and he, he holds the blade out and he bows to the blade and then he turns and he bows to you. And he says, I do not know the fastest way to the hamlet, but I trust that you do if you would lead the way. I do, and I'm gonna offer him the shield because I'm not I'm not taking any weapons. Okay. He he seems doubtful, and he says, "Are you sure you won't need this?" You'll see. Ah. And so he takes the shield as well, and he he's like, "You wouldn't happen to have any extra shoes, would you?" You can have mine. I'm not gonna need them. I'll give him to him. Seems confused, and but he he nods and he's like, "Yes, thank you." He, he straps the shoes onto his feet and he, he kind of walks around a little bit and he says, "I am ready." In just a moment, then keep your wits about you and trust them. And I'll shape change it into a dire wolf. Okay. So you you see that there's at first obvious surprise on his face. But as you complete your change and you kind of don't immediately attack him, you see the surprise turn into awe, like like amazement. And he, he smiles and he's like, ah, it is no accident that we came together. You are a guardian as well. Ah. And please lead on, my friend. 
and I'll shake my head and I'll start uh, going in that direction of uh, the little hamlet. So you you know a route that's pretty effective that avoids having to go through a lot of difficult terrain and and you follow the the, the river um, and going along the river's edge you make great time you cross the river and ford it onto um, a rising plateau where you know that there's a variety of farms and you kind of make your way through the open land. And as you, and this, this is miles away, mind you. Okay. Yep. But like you guys make pretty good timing and you notice that this old man actually has, he, he's not keeping up with you. He's not as fast as you as a dire wolf but he certainly is is not winded. Like he seems to be in good physical shape and he has a hardy constitution and he's, you know, sprinting the whole way yeah. with, with your shield and sword. And you guys make it through the open land and on the edge of, of the horizon, you see um, maybe a half mile away, you see this cluster of homes uh, in this farming cooperative and you see the land up ahead of you divided up into different plots. And mm -hmm. as you guys are getting closer and closer, you see there's like a dirt path that leads to the farming cooperative. And you see up ahead of you, those men are actually about a football field away from the farm co-op. And they're not sprinting, <clears throat> you guys are. They're kind of like walking quickly towards the farm co-op. Mm -hmm. um, so you see this and you kind of pick up your pace um, Kun Lee is doing his best, but you obviously as a dire wolf outpace him. So yeah. um, basically where we're going to pick up is you're, you're at a point where we're going to be going into initiative because you're yeah. getting to you're getting to the edge of this hamlet at the same yeah. time as those guys are walking up. So you're, mm -hmm. you're basically in dire wolf form coming out of a farm field of crops at this group of four guys. Okay. Yep. Um, so um, go ahead and roll. I'm pretty sure you're going to beat me. Yeah, you, I might not. Uh, five. five. <laughs> okay. So here's what happens. You you don't win initiative, but you're still surprising them. So you, yeah. you are going to jump out at them. Okay. You get one free attack. And then they win initiative. So yeah, um, there are, like I said, there are four guys. One of them who you clearly identified before as being kind of the leader who was barking yeah. off orders. So um, who do, who are you pouncing on? I'm just gonna attack uh, someone who's not the leader, just one of the general guys. Okay. All right. So go ahead and make an attack roll. A lot better. That's a uh, dirty twenty. Okay. And is this a, are you chomping down on with your jaws? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bite attack. So it's two, six, plus two, three, nine, uh, 12. Um, what's that? Ooh. Piercing damage. And then they need to make a DC 13, uh, DC 13 strength saving throw or be knocked from. All right. So number one, he is knocked prone. Number two, he's unconscious. You sink your teeth into like his neck and shoulder and rip out a chunk. <clears throat> I just like goes into shock and goes unconscious. All right. Mm -hmm. um, three of them turn completely yep. caught off guard. Now, they did have their swords out this whole time they've yes. been talking with their swords, but they are caught off guard. So um, they do not get any flanking bonus. They're just wildly swinging out as they are shocked by your arrival. Uh, what is your AC? 14. Okay, first one's a miss, second one's a hit, third one is a miss. So you will take three as a short sword cuts into your furry flesh. And it is back to your turn. All right, we're down to one. Let's jump on another guy, not the leader. Not so good. Uh, 13. That's a hit. They have padded armor, so. Okay. Uh, two, three, six damage. And another saving throw. What was the DC on the not to 13? 13. 13. 13. 
Okay, he made it. So okay. he takes the damage, but he's still standing and, and wielding the sword. Mm -hmm. Okay, attack number one, attack number two. Uh, attack number two is a hit. Mm -hmm. He'll take five. Now at this point, some of the villagers who aren't working in the fields, um, like they see this confrontation going and they're like, oh, oh, what's going on? They're like, you know, hide the children. And they're like kind of scurrying off for cover because they see these soldiers and they see the dire wolf. So they're, they're yeah. kind of in panic. Yeah. Um, as you, uh, it's, it's your turn, but out of the corner of your eye in dire wolf awareness, yeah. You see Kun Lee sprinting with the shield and sword towards you, and he'll be there next round. So, yep. turn. All right. Oh man, almost, almost crit. That's 19, natural 19. Okay, that's a hit. Are you attacking the guy that you've already bitten? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so it's five, eight, uh, 11 piercing. All right, he now goes down. Okay. Two down, two to go. One guy hits you with a 17, another guy hits you with a 15. Mm -hmm. You're going to take eight total damage. Okay. Um, Kun Lee arrives and attacks, rolling a 16 and a 17. Two hits. Nice. Matar. Four. Uh, nine plus six is 15. He cuts down one of the guys, leaving just the captain. Yep. Uh, it is your turn. I'm going to move slowly, like walking inside and just looking at him. And then I'll be in a flanking. Ro roll initiative, uh, not initiative, uh, intimidation <laughs> as a director. Okay. okay. Uh, you're you're kind of like that's talking. good. Uh, let's see, his charisma, oh, they're, they're a minus two. Uh, so that's a 16. That's still pretty damn good. Um, when you do this, you see the the captains like kind of looking back and forth, breathing heavily, looking at you and then looking at Kun Lee. And he's almost shocked to see Kun Lee like not bleeding out, you know, and mm -hmm. with a weapon. Kun Lee looks at him and he says, I suggest that you drop your sword or my friend might have to eat your face. And Kun Lee has a 18 for intimidation. So the captain <laughs> looks at him and he looks at you and then he, he drops his sword and he puts his hands up and he says, call off your beast. And Kun Lee says, he is not mine. His choices are his own. He may choose to make you into his lunch. Or perhaps he will be benevolent and choose to let you return to your master to give a message. And the captain's like, what? What message? And Kun Lee says, Tell your master that you killed Kun Lee and that a giant direwolf feasted on his corpse. Tell your master that the direwolf killed your comrades and that you barely escaped with a scratch on your face. And the captain's like, well, I don't have a scratch on my face. And as he's saying that, Kun Lee swings <laughs> out and cuts across his cheek. And the guy's like, ah! And there's, there's like a trickle of blood. And Kun Lee says, you serve a wicked and selfish master. You bring dishonor to yourself and your family by doing this. After you give your message to this master, you should consider giving your resignation of your services. Find a more noble profession. Perhaps you would be good as a farmer. The captain looks at Kun Lee and he looks at you and you see his eyes kind of dart down to his sword on the ground. Uh, I'll, I'll just smile like a dire wolf smile, just showing all my teeth. Okay, make another intimidation roll. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, dang, man, this minus two is killing me. Uh, that's just a ten. So, what is a dire wolf's strength? I'm just curious. Pretty, pretty good. It's a plus three, seventeen in total. Okay, so. Instead of using charisma for intimidation as a dire wolf, I think you're going to use strength. Okay. So go ahead uh, and roll that and <clears throat> add the plus three bonus from from Chris, uh, from strength. Uh, <laughs> that's a twenty-one. Okay. So you kind of flex your fur. You you smile a a dire wolf dire wolf snarl and pull your your lips back. And you see, without even needing to roll insight because you are quite proficient in it, it has had an impact. And the captain, he he looks back at Kun Lee and, and he, he's holding his cheek and the cut and he says, thank you for sparing my life. And he turns and he begins walking back down the road. You watch as the captain walks down the road. Uh, his other three comrades ha- are dead. They bled out. And Kun Lee looks to you and he says, I owe you a debt of gratitude as do these people. Though they may be more suspicious and they do not know that they owe you, I will not forget your generosity and your bravery. Uh, I'm going to drop my wild shape. Okay. You appear as you did before. Um, You see some of the farmers like running back from the fields towards the the cluster of of homes. Um, Kun Lee says... I leave it to you if you wish to go back to your your sanctuary I will help the farmers deal with these men's bodies and cleaning this area up or if you would like to stay and celebrate a meal with me I am certain that these kind farm folk would be more than happy to have us as their guests it's been some time since I've uh, been around other people. I think I'll, I'll enjoy the hospitality tonight. And I'm also going to pick up a scimitar and a shield from one of the other soldiers. You can keep So Kun Lee actually gives you your scimitar and shield. Okay. And begins collecting the four short swords. Mm-hmm. Um, and as the farmers arrive, Kun Lee introduces himself you see one of the older farmers seems to recognize Kun Lee and yeah. he, he comes in and, and shakes hands with Kun Lee and he calls his sons over they they gather the bodies of the soldiers um, and they they quickly begin digging a pit to bury them off the road um, and you see Kun Lee gesture to the four short swords um, all of which are not that great of quality um, but he says, perhaps uh, you could smelt this metal to make some some repairs to your plow, old friend, or perhaps for shovels and hoes. And he's like, certainly we could. Yes, thank you. They pick it up and they invite you guys back. And um, a few hours go late uh, go by. You guys have some some wine, and uh, the families kind of have this big feast uh, with you know fresh freshly gathered rice and and vegetables and uh, some chicken and and they you know you have this really nice meal with these very common people which is much different from how you grew up from the formality of the city in which you grew up and Mm -hmm. it seems to you like just a completely different world the world that these simple people live in the fact that in their homes, there are essentially just mats and they sit on the floor and they eat off of, you know, these mats and these simple wooden bowls and utensils. And what a stark contrast that was to the 
the affluence and wealth that you grew up with. Um, but as you spend these times, you know, going into the evening with these farmers and with Kun Lee, um, the farmers seem to love hearing the stories that Kun Lee tells about, uh, you know, the, the fight against the oppressors back in the old days. And um, you get the sense that they, you know, the farmers now probably have similar challenges that those, you know, who, who face those problems decades ago had to deal with. Yeah. Um, and as you guys are kind of, you finished dinner and now like, you know, the, the, the women are kind of putting the children to bed and the men are all kind of seated in a circle around a fire and drinking wine. You hear um, the sound of a cowbell and um, one of the young men looks up and, and, and you see the older father, like say, like he kind of nods to the young man and the young man gets up and leaves the, the house. And he comes back a few moments later and he opens the door and he says, father, there is a courier. And the father seems surprised. He's like, courier, what would he have to do in our village to see, seek a place to stay? And he says, no, father, he says that he has a message for someone here. And the older farmer looks at Kun Lee, and then he looks at you. And Kun Lee says, I am not expecting any messages, but I will see about this. And he steps outside. And you hear someone discussing something, and then a moment later, Kun Lee comes back in, and he looks at you, and he says, there is a message for the son of Lu Wei Zhen. And he looks at you kind of like suspiciously. That's my father. Hmm. Then perhaps you should come outside. I'll follow him. Um, you see a young man outside with short black hair. Um, he's younger than you. I mean, basically he looks like he's probably 19 or 20, but he's yeah. very physically fit. And mm -hmm. um, you see that he's standing next to a light, very agile looking horse. Um, and you notice that he is wearing the colors of Shoal Moon and he's like looks like an official courier mm -hmm. and he looks at you and he says are you the son of Lu Wei Zen? I am and he reaches into his pouch his courier pouch and he looks through and he he's like uh this is for you and he hands you a scroll and immediately upon receiving the scroll you see that there's a wax seal that it does indeed bear your family's symbol. I thank you. And the young man says, uh, and he looks to Kun Lee and he says, uh, it is very dark. I don't know that I want to travel back to the next village. Could I stay here tonight? And Kun Lee nods. The young man ties up his horse and then some of the other young farm men take him to uh, like a stable where he can make bedding. Mm -hmm. um, Kun Lee tells you, uh, I will leave you um, to, to your privacy and, and your message. And he nods and goes back inside to sit with the older men. So you find yourself outside of uh, one of the homes. You have a candle, there's, there's kind of like a tea candle um and the moonlight and you you have this scroll this wax sealed scroll Cade hey, uh looks at it turns it over into his hand kind of gives a heavy sigh for a moment and then he opens it reads the letter you open the scroll 
and it is a missive. You recognize the penmanship as uh, the, the, the style of calligraphy is that of your mother. Very, very fine, very elegant, very focused. Um, and it is a missive requiring you to return home that there's very urgent family business that must be addressed. And it is signed by your father and the signature of your father is truly your father's signature. You notice it has a much different style than your mother's. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not elegant and, you know, careful. It's very abrupt and almost angry. Like you can imagine in your head him, you know, scratching this out with his, his quill. Um, and, and you look at this, you look at this scroll, you look at the message calling you home and it, you begin to think about how different your life is now. And as you're standing in this hobble of, you know, poor farmers, um, yet they are happy and they're, they, they have a contentment you think about the capital city of the province and what it will be like to return to that and to to see the affluence of your family and and the other noble families in the city and you begin to kind of think of this as you're looking at the scroll and you look up to the night sky and the moon is full and it you look out over the farmland and you hear the sounds of insects in the night, birds in the night, frogs. And you look up to the moon again and you know that you will have to go heed the call of your family. And that is yeah. where we're going this prequel <laughs> of High Adventure featuring Cade's backstory uh the next time you see us will be on episode one so stay tuned because this campaign is going to be awesome It's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things. And also you could watch Bill eat food and watch other shows featuring Bill. He made me say that because he's a narcissist. Okay, bye.